Welcome to Alexandria. Today, we dive into the tale of Romulus, Rome's legendary founder, with a simplified take on Jacob Abbott's classic. In this first chapter of our journey with Romulus, we're starting with Cadmus, the opening act of the story. If you're curious to hear more, make sure to subscribe and leave a like. Now let's turn the page to chapter one and begin our adventure into the past. Makers of History, Romulus. Chapter one, Cadmus, BC, 1500. Some people in history are famous for their extraordinary abilities and achievements. Others, although they haven't accomplished anything particularly great or amazing, are widely known because of the significant consequences that resulted from their actions. These individuals are noticeable rather than exceptional. Among many other individuals of similar character, they stand out in history because of the significant events that followed their actions. Romulus, a famous person, founded a city. Many others have also founded cities and shown courage, intelligence, and mental power like Romulus. However, Romulus's city became very powerful and influential. It held a high position for a long time. For the past 20 centuries, every civilized nation in the Western world has been interested in its history and curious about its origin. As a result, Romulus and the story of his life have gained significant attention. Although Romulus didn't perform extraordinary feats during his time and wasn't more remarkable than other similar leaders, who are now forgotten, his name and his life have become well-known due to the events that followed and the interest of people. The history of Rome typically starts with the story of Aeneas. To help readers understand the significance of this romantic tale, it is important to provide some background information about the general state of society in ancient times and the nature of the unusual stories that were circulated during those early periods. These stories were later compiled and recorded as history by learned individuals when the practice of writing became more widespread. The countries bordering the Mediterranean Sea were just as green and beautiful in ancient times as they are now. Italy and Greece were there back then, with the same stunning seas, mountains, picturesque shores, charming valleys, and peaceful sky. The flatlands were farmed by hardworking rural people who shared many similarities with today's peasants. Shepherds and herdsmen, like today, hunted wild animals and cared for their flocks and herds on the mountain slopes. In simple terms, the way nature looks and how society provides food and clothing for people through farming hasn't changed much in the past 2,000 years in the Mediterranean region. The plants and animals that ancient people raised were similar to the ones we have today. They had the same kinds of sheep, oxen, and horses. They also grew grapes, apples, and corn, just like we do now. If we look at the two periods and compare the classes and occupations, we will see that there are significant differences. While there was an aristocracy in both periods, the characteristics, preferences, ideas, and occupations of the aristocrats were completely different from the governing classes in modern Europe. The nobles of that time were military leaders who lived in camps or walled cities that they built for themselves and their followers. It's important to note that these leaders were not barbarians, they were cultured and refined in a way. They gathered people in their camps and courts who were skilled in speaking, writing, governing, and serving in the military. These people had the same energy, talent, taste, and scientific knowledge that are often seen in the higher classes of the Caucasian race throughout history. They were highly skilled in all the arts necessary for their plans, and they excelled in creating stories, songs, and poems for their events and celebrations. Their taste and skill were admirable, as they came from their natural genius rather than following strict rules. In fact, their poetic creations were made before any rules were established. Rules were developed based on their creations, as they became widely recognized as models of beauty in speech and poetry. These models still greatly influence our understanding of rhetorical and poetic beauty today. In those days, people didn't believe in a spiritual world or a spiritual god. 
They did, however, think that the heroes from the past still lived and ruled in semi-heavenly places on top of their beautiful mountains. They believed these heroes had some divine qualities. Besides these gods, people in ancient times had a vivid imagination and filled the earth, air, sea, and sky with imaginary beings. These beings were graceful, beautiful, and had special roles, which were the subjects of countless legends and tales that were just as graceful, beautiful, and poetic as the beings themselves. Every grove, fountain, river, mountain summit, rock, promontory, cave, valley, and waterfall had its own imaginary resident, the spirit of the place. Thus, every natural object that caught public attention was the inspiration for a picturesque and romantic tale. In short, nature was not explored back then for the purpose of discovering and documenting cold scientific facts, but rather to be admired, enhanced, and brought to life with exquisitely beautiful yet imaginary and supernatural beings and events. In ancient times, imaginative and romantic geniuses embellished and brought to life history and natural scenery with supernatural and marvelous elements, not seeking factual realities. Actual truth held no interest or importance for them. At that time, there weren't scholars surrounded by libraries engaged in the pursuit of researching and uncovering the simple truth. There was no solitude, no seclusion, no study. Everything, except for the daily labor of farming, revolved around military expeditions, spectacles, and parades. The only outlet for the intellectual ability used today to investigate and document historical truth was through the creation and recitation of poems, dramas, and tales. These were meant to entertain large military audiences in camps or public gatherings, held to witness shows, games, or celebrate religious festivals. Under these circumstances, there was no interest in truth for truth's sake. Romance and fable served a much greater purpose than reality in such contexts. It is clear that stories created to entertain would be more interesting if they were based on some truth and connected to real places. A prince and his court would be more engaged in a story about their own ancestors' deeds and adventures than a completely made-up one. The storytellers usually chose subjects that were embellishments of real events rather than completely fictional. The heroes were real people, their actions were real, and the places mentioned were real too. This gave the stories a sense of truth and made them more captivating. Since there was no way to verify the actual truth, it didn't spoil the story by revealing its falsehood or implausibility. We can see a good example of these principles in the story of Cadmus, an adventurer who is said to have brought alphabetic writing to Greece from some countries in the East. Nowadays, there is a lot of interest in finding out the exact truth about this. The invention of writing with alphabetic characters was a great invention and has had a huge impact on humanity since its introduction. That's why there is a strong interest in knowing the actual facts about its origin. If we could determine the circumstances under which the method of representing sounds with written characters was first created, find out who came up with the idea, what led them to try it, what difficulties they faced, how they first used their invention, and what results it brought. The whole world would be very interested in knowing. The most important thing to note is that people today are interested in knowing the true origins of writing. Even if a fiction writer were to create a clever and entertaining story about the origin of writing, it would not generate any interest among scholars today. Currently, there is no definitive account of how alphabetic characters actually originated. However, there is a record of how the art of writing was brought from Asia to Europe, where it is believed to have been originally invented. We will first present the simple facts and then provide the narrative as it was told in ancient times, embellished by the storytellers of that era. There was a king named Agenor in Africa around 1500 years before Christ. He had a daughter named Europa and several sons, one of whom was Cadmus. Europa was beautiful, 
and a man from the northern shores of the Mediterranean Sea came to Africa, disguised himself as a servant, and got to know Europa. He convinced her to run away with him, and they crossed the Mediterranean Sea to an island called Crete, where they lived together. When the father discovered that his daughter had lied to him and run away, he was very angry. He sent Cadmus and his brothers to find her. Europa's mother, Telephassa, was also upset but less angry than the father. She was devastated by the loss of her child and decided to join her sons in the search. She said goodbye to her husband and her homeland and embarked on a long journey with Cadmus and her other sons to find her lost child. Agenor told his sons that they should never return home unless they brought Europa with them. Cadmus, his mother, and brothers traveled slowly northward along the eastern shores of the Mediterranean Sea. They searched everywhere for the fugitive. They passed through different places such as Syria, Phoenicia, Asia Minor, and Greece. Eventually, Telephassa, exhausted from fatigue, disappointment, and grief, passed away. Cadmus and his brothers soon became discouraged. They were tired from their travels and unable to return without Europa due to their father's command. As a result, they decided to settle in Greece. However, they encountered various conflicts while trying to establish themselves there. They faced challenges from wild animals and the native people of the land who seemed to appear out of nowhere to oppose them. Eventually, they managed to gain a foothold in Greece by instigating quarrels among their enemies and aligning themselves with one faction against the others. Cadmus ultimately established a city in Greece, which he named Thebes. In establishing the institutions and government of Thebes, Cadmus introduced several new arts to the people. One of these arts was using copper, which he taught the people to obtain from mines. He also taught them 16 letters to represent vocal sounds, so they could carve inscriptions on monuments or tablets. It is unknown whether Cadmus originated the idea of representing vocal sounds or if he brought it from Egypt or Phoenicia. These are the known facts. Now, let's compare this simple account with the romantic tale told by early storytellers. According to the legend, Jupiter was a prince born and raised on Mount Ida in Crete. His father's name was Saturn. Saturn had made a promise that he would kill all his sons as soon as they were born. He did this to please his brother, who was his rival, and agreed that Saturn could continue to rule only if he did this. Jupiter's mother, however, did not want her boys to be killed in such a cruel way. She managed to hide three of them and save them. These three were raised in the mountains, taken care of by nymphs and nursed by a goat. When they grew up, they fought in various wars and had many amazing adventures. Eventually, Jupiter, the oldest of them, became the king by using thunderbolts that he had made in underground caves beneath Mount Etna and Mount Vesuvius. He defeated all his enemies and became the ruler of everything. He shared his empire with his brothers, giving them control of the sea and the underground regions, while he kept the earth and the sky for himself. He lived in the mountains of northern Greece and often went on adventures in different disguises. During one of his trips, he went to Egypt and saw the beautiful daughter of Agenor, Europa. He decided to marry her and transformed into a handsome bull to get close to her. Europa noticed him among Agenor's cattle. She really liked how he looked and thought he was nice and friendly. She went up to him, touched his smooth neck and sides, and showed her admiration and enjoyment in other ways. Eventually, because of some mysterious and magical power that the prince had over her, she decided to get on his back and let him carry her away. The bull ran to the shore and jumped into the waves. He swam across the sea to Crete, and there, turned back into his true form, he married the princess. Agenor and Telephassa were really sad when they found out that their daughter was gone. Agenor decided to send his sons to find her. His sons' names were Cadmus, Phonix, Silix, Thassus, and Phineas. Cadmus, being the oldest, was in charge of the expedition. Telephassa, the mother, wanted to go with them because she was so upset about losing her daughter. 
Agenor was also very sad and told his sons not to come back until they found Europa. Telephasa and her sons searched for their missing family member in the countries to the east of the Mediterranean Sea, but they couldn't find any clues. They then moved to Asia Minor and from there to Thrace, a place north of the Aegean Sea. When they still couldn't find their sister, Agenor's sons felt hopeless and decided to stop searching. Tired and stressed, Telephasa was filled with despair and passed away. Cadmus and his brothers were sad when their mother passed away. They made sure she had a proper funeral, fitting for her status. After the funeral, Cadmus decided to visit the Oracle at Delphi. This was located in the north of Greece, not too far from Thrace. His goal was to find out if there was any way to find his lost sister, and if so, what he should do next. The oracle told him to stop looking for his sister and focus on creating a home and a kingdom in Greece. He was to follow a particular cow, described by the oracle, and follow her wherever she went. When the cow finally got tired and lay down, he was to build a city there and make it his capital. Cadmus followed the oracle's guidance and left Delphi with a group of companions. They found a cow in the herds of a local named Pelagon, which matched the oracle's description, so they followed it. The cow led them south and east for about 30 to 40 miles until it seemed tired and laid down. Cadmus quickly realized this was where his city would be and immediately started planning the city construction. However, he first decided to offer the cow which had guided him here, as a sacrifice to Minerva, whom he considered his protecting goddess. Near where the cow rested, there was a small stream from a nearby source called the Durse Fountain. Cadmus sent some of his people to get water for the sacrifice ceremony from this fountain, which was special and dedicated to the god Mars, and a large dragon, Mars's son, protected it. When Cadmus's men didn't come back, he went to find out why after waiting for a while. Cadmus found the dragon eating his men. He fought and killed the beast, taking its teeth as a victory trophy. With Minerva's help, he planted the teeth in the ground. Suddenly, many armed men appeared. Cadmus threw a stone, causing them to fight each other. In the end, only five remained. These five helped Cadmus build his city. After this, he was very successful. He built a city called Thebes, which later became very famous. The fortress he built inside was named Cadmia after himself. These stories were told in old poems and tales, and it's clear they were made to entertain people who wanted to be thrilled and entertained, not taught. People probably believed these stories, and this belief likely made the stories more interesting. We find these stories amusing, but we can't feel the deep seriousness ancient audiences did because we can't believe them as they did. If similar tales were told about modern celebrities, they wouldn't be interesting because we know too much history and philosophy to think they're true. But when the story of Europa was made up, people didn't know how big the Mediterranean Sea was or if a bull could swim across it. They didn't know if Mars could have a dragon son, or if the dragon's teeth could grow into an army when planted in the ground. People listened to the story with great interest because it was so extraordinary. They told it to each other exactly as it was, at their camps, during feasts, and while traveling. They even shared it while watching their flocks on lonely mountains at midnight. This is how the story was passed down from one generation to the next. Eventually, writing became easier, so they started to write these stories down in many forms. This allowed the stories to be preserved without any more changes until today. Thank you for joining us for the first part of Romulus's captivating story. If you're eager to see what happens next, simply click on the video popping up on your screen or check out the link in the description for part two. We have a whole library of similar audiobooks waiting for you on our channel so feel free to explore and enjoy more tales of history and myth. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share to help us bring more stories to life. Until next time, thank you for listening and watching with Alexandria.